thank you for coming. Um, our speaker today, Anne Garland Mahler, teaches in the Spanish department at the University of Arizona, and as she reminded me last night, I remembered the first part of this, but she reminded me of the second part, which is we met several years ago as graduate students on the way to an ACLA conference. Um, Anne Garland was sitting in the middle seat, and this is the part that I've forgotten. She got trapped in a conversation with a person sitting by the window who asked her to explain to her what comparative literature was. Um, <laughs> I've totally forgotten this. I think it was a really good explanation, especially for someone who was coming to the ACLA but was training in a Spanish department. Since then, we've sort of crossed paths many times in our work. We're both on the MLA's new forum for the Global South, and Anne Garland's been doing a lot of work in this area for several years. Um, in part, the work she's been doing is thinking about the genealogy of the concept beyond and outside of its associations with the post-colonial, for which her training as a Latin Americanist is key. It brings a whole other archive um, and a whole other set of global connections to the way in which we think about the global south. Um, to that end, uh, she's published work in journals such as Small Acts and the Latin American Research Review. Her book, The Color of Resistance, Race, and Solidarity from the Tricontinental to the Global South is forthcoming from Duke UP. And she's also working on some future projects, including one on paramilitarism and the Americas, um, for which she and Joshua Lund at Pitt received a 2015 um, grant from the, from the Ford Foundation in collaboration with the Latin American Studies Association. So sort of projects that open into the Global South are continuing beyond this first book, which she'll be speaking about today. All right, well, I want to thank uh, yeah, my friend Magali, Professor Ar Armias Tiseida, um, for having me, and to Professor Eburn for having me. Also, um, thanks so much to Ms. Nicole Reed for arranging everything and uh, doing all the work to get me here. Thank you guys for being here. I'm really, uh, really excited to be here and share a little bit of what um, I'm working on. I'm going to stand up here just because I have um, a, a Prezi. So this talk um, and the larger project uh, that it comes out of begins from the observation that we, can everybody hear me okay? So it begins from the observation that we are witnessing a radical expansion in solidarity politics where grassroots movements use innovations and communication technologies to forge alliances with struggles all over the world. The globally networked nature of politics today has challenged the models with which critics approach politically resistant cultural production, leading to a divergence in the last 15 years from the rubrics of postcolonial and ethnic studies to what might be considered horizontalist approaches to cultural criticism. So with these horizontalist approaches, I'm referring both to concepts that describe a transnational resistant subjectivity that arises in response to global capitalism, as well as to reading praxis that deviate from center periphery models and move towards decentered network readings of anti systemic textual production. These approaches rely on a view of power as unmoored from territorial boundaries and emphasize lateral dialogue and mutual identification among oppressed groups in terms transcendent of a shared experience of European colonization or of national, ethnic, and linguistic affinities. So among concepts that range from a polarized grassroots globalization to subaltern cosmopolitanism and alternative solidarities, uh, Shumisha and Francois Lyonnais' minor transnationalism, and Gugi Wationgo's reading globalectically, the global south um, among these terms has gained the most currency. While it's often used to refer to economically disadvantaged nation states and as a post-Cold War alternative uh, to third world, in recent years, the Global South is being employed in a post-national Gramscian sense to address spaces and peoples negatively impacted by capitalist globalization. It captures a deterritorialized geography of capitalism's externalities and means to account for subjugated peoples within the borders of wealthier countries, such that there are Souths in the geographic North and Norths in the geographic South. The Global South is being employed to address both horizontalist approaches mentioned previously, referring to a global political subjectivity that results from the mutual recognition of a shared experience of subjugation and to a model for the comparative study of um, resistant cultural production. So the Global South, I think, is a valuable framework for engaging our contemporary moment, but these new categories risk alighting the historical context from which today's solidarity politics have emerged and rep reproducing a sort of atemporal 
end of history narrative of globalization. So in response, I want to try to use this talk uh, to provide a possible account of the cultural history of this horizontal turn, arguing that the category of the global south represents an, an attempt to recover key elements of an influential Cold War movement, that of tricontinentalism, that has been consistently overlooked uh, within the realm of postcolonial theory. Um, tricontinentalism, if you haven't heard of it, was disseminated among the international left through the expansive cultural production of the organization of <coughs> solidarity with the peoples of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, or simply the Tricontinental Alliance. Excuse me. This organization uh, formed in January 1966 when delegates from the liberation movements of 82 nations came together at the Tricontinental Conference in Havana, Cuba to forge an alliance against imperialism. It had the close involvement of African American and US Latino activists, and it represents the extension into the Americas of the much more well-known Afro-Asian Bandung Alliance, uh, which is often seen as an originating moment of postcolonial theory. Perhaps its most lasting legacy is its prolific propaganda machine uh, that included Tricontinental Bulletin, Tricontinental Magazine, um, which were published from 1966 to 1990, as well as posters that were folded up inside the magazine um, and that were each devoted to solidarity with a different liberation struggle. Okay, yeah. So all of these materials were published in English, Spanish, French, and sometimes Arabic and distributed globally. Uh, many of Shepard Ferry's po posters, Shepard Ferry, the graphic artist, many of his posters, including his Barack Obama Hope poster, are essentially ripoffs of these posters, um, something that I think speaks to the continued relevance of the aesthetics that these posters popularized, as well as this wide dissemination of the Tricontinental's materials. Uh, the Tricontinental also produced books and pamphlets, radio programs, and the Kayak Latin American Newsreel short films made by the Cuban Film Institute and headed up by filmmaker Santiago Al Alvarez that were often distributed internationally. These materials were all produced in Cuba, but much of the content of the articles, for example, uh, were sent in by the various delegations, such that the Tricontinental's cultural production shaped and was shaped by the perspectives of the various delegations it represented. The discourse of tricontinentalism that appears in these materials emerges, I argue, directly out of a black Atlantic um, exchange, directly out of black Atlantic intellectual thought. So sometimes tricontinentalism is used in exchange with a notion of Cuban internationalism. And I really want to get away from this overwrought notion of Cuban internationalism or of the Cuban state's foreign policy and consider the ways in which tricontinentalism operated as a space of transnational and specifically Black Atlantic exchange. Tricontinentalism, I argue, revises a Black Atlantic resistance subjectivity into a global vision of subaltern resistance that is resurfacing in contemporary social movements and in newly emerging horizontalist approaches to cultural criticism. So tracing that shift from a Black Atlantic resistance subjectivity to a global transracial tricontinentalist one is going to be the focus of the rest of the talk. So as I said, um, the Tricontinental represents the extension into the Americas of the Afro-Asian Alliance of Decolonized Nations begun at the 1955 Bandung Conference. And the idea to extend this alliance into the, Ameri into the Americas originated with Afro-Cuban intellectual Walterio Carbonell, who at this time was the ambassador for the Castro government to Tunisia, but who was later severely persecuted for his critique of um, domestic racial inequities on the island. <coughs> in the December 5, 1959 issue of the Cuban newspaper Revolución, Carbonell explains that although the African and Asian countries that met at Bandung were now independent of the European colonial powers, they, remai they remained threatened by el colonialismo disfrazado, the disguised colonialism of the United States that had so affected Latin America. Um, he proposes that these regions come together to form a third power block, claiming that Cuba should take a leadership role in this global anti-colonial movement, and even proposing Havana as the location for El Proximo Congreso de los Países Subdesarrollados, the next conference 
of underdeveloped countries. Prior to his stint in Tunisia, Carbonell had, had been living in Paris, where he was integrated into a transnational community of black intellectuals that emerged from the exchange between Negritude, Negrismo, and the Harlem Renaissance, an exchange that Richard Jackson has simply referred to as the Afro-Criollo <coughs> movement. Carbonell uh, participated, for example, in the 1956 First International Conference of Negro Writers and Artists in Paris, which was frequently described by the participants as a follow-up to Bandung, and in which Césaire, Fanon, Senghor, James Baldwin, and Richard Wright, among others, were all present. According to Baldwin, who published the essay, Princes and Powers, about his participation at this conference in Paris, one of the central questions for the writers present was in response to Fanon's critique of the essentialisms of the Afro-Criollo movement. So this question dealt with how transnational black intellectuals might articulate a common subjectivity that does not present itself either as a mythic return to a pre-colonial origin or as an antithesis to a colonial notion of whiteness. So even though you know, movements like Negritude, Negrismo, and the Harlem Renaissance were internally heterogeneous and they were diverse movements, I mean, most Negrista writers were white, for example, um, and they served diverse functions in their respective geographic and linguistic contexts, this question at the conference, I think, is really responding to two common threads shared by these movements. First, Afro-Criollo writings tend to uphold blackness as the emblem of both a transnational experience of imperialist exploitation, as well as the resistance to that exploitation. And second, within their anti-imperialist use of phenotypic blackness and pan-Africanist symbology, Afro-Criollo writings tend towards essentialist representation. So this is what Fanon critiques in Black Skin, White Mass, recognizing the importance and value of these movements for black self-definition, but arguing that in their celebration of irrationalism, myth, and corporality, the identity they fashion is a mere antithesis to colonial whiteness. So the question of how to get out of this binary is, according to James Baldwin, the main focus of discussion at this writers' conference in Paris um, in 1956. And Walterio Car Carbonell, the Cuban intellectual who had the idea to, extend, to expand the Bandung Alliance into the Americas is present at this conference and present for these conversations, right? Another of the participants is African-American writer Richard Wright, who actually traveled to Bandung, Indonesia for the Bandung Conference and who published a memoir about it called The Color Curtain. In this text, Wright takes this transnational black resistance subjectivity from the Afro-Criollo <coughs> movement and expands it to be more inclusive. With his notion of the color curtain, Wright employs the term color to refer to all racialized peoples, not just those of African descent. However, despite this expansion from a black resistant subjectivity to a color curtain, he continues to maintain the antithetical and essentialist discourse that was the subject of Fanon's critique. And Skip Gates has a really scathing review of Wright's The Color Curtain that lays out some of these essentialist representations. So although Wright uses the color curtain to refer to the Afro-Asian sol solidarity of Bandung, we might consider it a metaphor for a notion of a political resistance of color that, like the Iron Curtain from which Wright takes its name, is overdetermined and constitutive of binary oppositions. So I see tricontinentalism as attempting to push beyond the color curtain. And by that, I don't mean that it, specifically res that it responds specifically to Wright's memoir about his experience at Bandung, nor do I intend to collapse Wright's notion of the color curtain with the Bandung conference itself. But I'm suggesting that as the spirit of Bandung extends into the Americas to become the tricontinental, it responds to certain tendencies and debates within black Atlantic anti-imperialist thought leading up to this moment. Specifically, the category of color that you see in Wright's text becomes increasingly discursively open, uh, expressing a broader revolutionary subjectivity that is intended to be inclusive of all resistant oppressed peoples regardless of skin color, ethnicity, or locality. The tricontinentals, this expanded resistant subjectivity um, does not empty this prior black Atlantic anti-imperialism of its critique of racism, but rather articulates its global vision of power and resistance precisely through the language of racial inequality and racial violence and especially through a focus on African Americans and the African American freedom movement. The language of racial inequality in tricontinental materials takes on a unique form since racial categories 
are sometimes used not to refer to perceived embodied difference, but rather as metonyms for the global political positions that underlie the Tricontinental Project. And this is what I call the Tricontinental's met metonymic color politics, in which whiteness is used metonymically to refer to global empire, and color functions as a metonym for a trans-ethnic resistant community. In other words, in contrast to the overdetermined category of the color curtain, within the tricontinentalist political signifier of color, color remains an umbrella for a politics of anti-imperialism, but does not necessarily denote the skin color of the peoples included under that umbrella. And these metonymic color politics really get um, expressed through a focus on the African American freedom struggle in tricontinental materials. And I'll talk about uh, how that works in a minute. <coughs> So, um, in the 11 years between the Bandung moment of decolonization and the entrance of the Americas into this alliance, there are pivotal shifts that take place. So, for example, the U.S. military intervention in Vietnam and the recognition of Cuba and Vietnam as participating in a joint struggle will be the major catalyst for bringing the Afro-Asian alliance together with Latin America at the Tricontinental. More importantly, perhaps, the Tricontinental will explicitly state its unity with struggles within imperial centers, such as African Americans in the United States, necessitating thus a more flexible concept of imperial power and subjugation. Although particularly critical of the United States, the notion of imperialism in Tricontinental materials is not necessarily tied to the actions of any one nation. So Tricontinental Bulletin, quotes um, U.S. civil rights activist Stokely Carmichael as saying, imperialism is an exploiting octopus whose tentacles extend from Mississippi and Harlem to Latin America, the Middle East, South Africa, and Vietnam. So the logic behind the tricontinental is that the resistance to this global monster, right, has to be equally global. This concept, as Robert J.C. Young reminds us, is summed up aptly by Che Guevara in his 1967 message to the tricontinental, in which he defines this new revolutionary subject not as the proletarian of Marxism, but as nosotros explotados del mundo, we the exploited people of the world. Among these exploited people of the world, the Tricontinental, especially in its first 10 years, consistently privileges African Americans. So this includes like, explicit statements of inclusion of African Americans into the alliance, uh, numerous articles devoted to the African American struggle in its publications, posters that state solidarity um, with African Americans, and several newsreels, including the, the, the famous uh, six-minute film Now by Santiago Alvarez. If you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. It's pretty amazing. Um, and this concern with the African American cause is not simply rhetoric. I mean, Stokely Carmichael becomes a member of the Tricontinental. Robert F. Williams, the NAACP activist from North Carolina who's exiled in Cuba in the mid-1960s, is present at the first Tricontinental Conference. Um, many Tricontinental materials appear, for example, in the Black Panther Party newspaper. Um, and this exchange with African American struggle comes out of a longer history of the Castro government's outreach to African Americans, which it must be said was, used, was often used to externalize the Cuban Revolution's own racial problems to the imperialist North. Um, a lot of the African American activists who end up spending time in Cuba realize that the support of black liberation movements abroad does not necessarily apply to black people attempting to organize within, uh, within Cuba. But even as people like Robert, William, Robert F. Williams and Stokely Carmichael distance themselves from Castro and the Cuban Revolution, this discourse of tricontinentalism continues to surface in their writings. In its bulletin and magazine, the Tricontinental consistently argues that African Americans are fighting in the very guts of the imperialist monster. Uh, this position is summed up aptly in a 1971 poster, oh there's now, okay. Um, it's summed up in a 1971 poster in it, which an abstract drawing of an African American man holding a gun appears inside an outline of a map of the United States. The caption beneath it states, we will destroy imperialism from the outside, they will destroy it from the inside. Although arguably the use of we and they undercuts the Tricontinental's explicit inclusion of African Americans into the alliance, the statement of solidarity at the bottom of the poster reinforces the shared cause of African American activists with liberation struggles in the three continents. More importantly, the, cap the poster captures precisely the tension 
that tricontinentalist subjectivity inhabits in which they become a part of we and exploited peoples inside the geographic boundaries of imperial centers are viewed as united with those from outside. The importance attributed to the African American cause is meant to extend as well to other groups struggling from within the United States. This includes, according to Tricontinental Bulletin, quote, the white population and other national minorities, Puerto Ricans, Mexican Americans, and others in the heat of the present process of radicalization, end quote. The fight being fought by African Americans is one for which other US radicals, regardless of skin color, are also responsible. Here, African Americans become emblematic of the tricontinental slippage between we and they outside and inside, a liminality that, as I will explain, also applies to ethnicity and skin color. The liminal position attributed to African Americans is articulated in many tricontinental materials, um, such as the 1968 newsreel El Movimiento Panteras Negras, a film about encounters between black militants and police in the United States. The film alternates between quotes by Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., coupled with footage of police brutality against African Americans and image for images from a police manual and riot gear, with a voiceover that, in a detournement that is typical of tricontinental materials, sarcastically narrates the manual as if it were an advertisement. So I want to watch a little clip. Oh, nope, that's not what we want. Okay, hold on. How do we go back? <coughs> Sorry about this. Let's see. Okay. Hopefully, I can um, start it. Here we go. Okay. There we go. Okay, oh, okay, so the film posits that the mace in the police manual is de designed specifically for use against black militants. It states, mace is a novel chemical product, just spray it rioting black's eyes, it never fails, a sprayed black is a down black, request a free demonstration, use mace and laugh at what takes place. But the voiceover also boasts that these weapons are economicos y eficaces, right, economical and efficient against workers, students, blacks, whites, and against all whom disturb peace and order. By extending the possible victims of police oppression to whites and to the general descriptions of students and workers, the film signals its many images of bloodied African-American protesters as emblematic of a larger power struggle that goes beyond the black-white divide. This point is further emphasized in the last frame of the film, which states over a map of the world that 1968 is the year of the heroic guerrilla fighter. In other words, instead of ending the film with a statement of solidarity with U.S. blacks, the film explicitly relates their struggle to a global unity and signals African-American militants as representative of all the guerrilleros fighting imperialism throughout the world. By depicting the white policemen's oppression of African-Americans in these tricontinental newsreels, the filmmaker Santiago Alvarez exploits the colonial and Jim Crow categories of white and colored. These films and other similar tricontinental materials both seek to incorporate, incorporate African-Americans into the project of the tricontinental as well as appropriate an African-American identity to stand in for all the exploited people of the world. The film is at once a reference to the African-American cause and to the struggles of black people everywhere, as well as an abstraction of the global struggle with which every tricontinental member can identify. This strategy is often expressed in tricontinental materials through defining its global revolutionary subjectivity, not through the socialist rhetoric of class struggle, 
but through employing the term color, such as in colored peoples or colored leader, to refer not necessarily to skin color, but to one's alignment with anti-imperialist politics. So in tricontinental materials and in closely related sites of cultural production where this ideology circulates, you have this discursively open use of this category of color. Um, in tricontinental bulletin, for example, white Appalachian radicalist youth are grouped into the category of colored peoples. Or in the Crusader, um, the newsletter that Robert F. Williams, that NAACP activist that I mentioned earlier, the newsletter he published from exile in Cuba and later in China, um, in that newsletter, Fidel Castro is described as a colored leader. In the writings of the New York Puerto Rican radicalist group, the Young Lords Party, who um, who they reprint a lot of tricontinental materials in their newspaper, and their 13-point platform is reprinted in the March 1971 issue of Tricontinental Bulletin. Um, in that 13-point platform, they explain that they are fighting for the liberation of all colored and oppressed peoples, which they explicitly state includes poor white people. In this sense, Guevara's revolutionary subject arises out of a pre-existing discourse which Rich Richard Wright called the color curtain that appropriated the colonial language of color to create a phenotypic label for international resistance. But while Guevara's exploited people of the world may arise from this pre-existing discourse of color, the tricontinentalist use of color is an ideological referent that does not necessarily describe the skin color of the tricontinentalist revolutionary, but rather the anti-imperialist contours of her politics. This racial abstraction is what I have referred to as the tricontinental's metonymic color politics which through the use of racially coded terminology and through the repetition of images of mostly Anglo-American policemen and African-American protesters, tricontinental materials metonymically employ categories of white and color, using white policemen to signify global imperial oppression and images of African-Americans to stand in for all the exploited people of the world. Um, and this continues to be a central part of the tricontinental's ideology, even as there is a shift in focus away from the African-American struggle um, towards South Africa as Cuba becomes involved in South Africa in the late 70s and 80s. Um, you have that same black-white division, but that's used to signify this global struggle. So tricontinentalism takes up a pre-existing signifier of black anti-imperialism, which Wright expanded into a color cur curtain to include peoples of non-African descent. And it attempts to move beyond its relationship to perceived physical difference and, the essential and essentialist representations and toward an abstract use of color that refers to a shared political ideology. In this way, the tricontinental provides a framework for imagining a new global revolutionary subjectivity that is increasingly relevant in our contemporary moment. Although its materials continue to be produced and disseminated to this day, the central contributions of the tricontinental have been largely forgotten. This erasure is due to um, a combination of several factors, such as disillusionment with Cuba's repression of intellectual freedoms um, and the severe weakening of the left in the Americas in the 1970s and 80s. But equally significant is the way in which Cold War decolonization discourses would become preserved within the academic field of postcolonial studies, a field which has tended to focus on the former African and Asian colonies represented at Bandung, and which has generally had a contentious relationship with Latin Americanism. Postcoloniality post has been largely theorized through a historical circumstance of former colonization rather than necessarily an ideological stance of anti-imperialism. The tricontinental, however, was focused on global solidarity organized around ideological affinities. While it recognized similarities between experiences of oppression, the basis of its solidarity was not dependent on those similarities, nor was it dependent on trait-based characteristics such as skin color or geographic location. But despite this general erasure of the tricontinental, I think we are seeing a revival of key ideological and aesthetic elements of the tricontinental in contemporary social movements in the Americas. So for example, you see a revival of the tricontinental in the aesthetics of the colorful screen printed political posters of the Occupy movement and the World Social Forum um, that have at times, like I said, been direct copies of tricontinental screen prints or in the ironic montages and appropriation of television and popular music in the contemporary political remix video that's all over YouTube and that are clearly reminiscent of tricontinental newsreels. These aesthetic returns are surface indicators of a deeper ideological revival of tricontinentalism. So one of the most important documents of the World Social Forum, for example, literally calls for a return to the tricontinental. But I'm also talking about, you know, for example, Hart and Negri's theorization of an empire that creates more revolutionary potential, 
since it yields an international set of all the exploited and the subjugated set of all the exploited and the subjugated a multitude that is directly opposed to empire. This concept, radically similar to Guevara's tricontinental notion of we the exploited people of the world, attempts to, attempts to capture the way in which global capitalism creates the conditions for an equally global emancipatory politics. Hart and Negri's multitude is just one of several recent, several relatively recent critical categories like the global south that have important points of convergence with the tricontinental's discourse. So it is the tricontinental's global concept of power, lateral solidarity among liber liberation struggles, destabilization of trait-based claims to belonging, and concern for a resistance that forms from within an empire to which there is no outside, that makes the tricontinental a model uh, that anticipates and is intrinsically relevant to the contemporary Global South imaginary. However, um, Although we are seeing a revival of this tricontinental model in some ways, I think it's, we can't forget that this movement framed its critique of global capitalism precisely through a lens of racial violence and racial inequality. So we are witnessing widespread protests against neoliberal policies and against state brutality towards racially oppressed peoples, but there is a fundamental paradox within social movements in the Americas today. On the one hand, protests directed at global capitalism tend to reproduce the rhetoric of multiculturalism, generating silences around racial inequities, you know, we are the 99% type thing. On the other, movements organized around racial justice tend to frame violence towards racialized populations within a context limited to a critique of the state, sidelining a broader consideration of the intersection between racial violence and global capital flows. In this sense, the contemporary revival of tricontinentalism within horizontalist social movements is stripped of its most valuable contribution, its metonymic color politics, which allowed for an inclusionary resistant subjectivity, but which still kept racism and the image of global capitalism as a racializing apparatus in the spotlight. So I'm not calling here for some kind of like triumphant return to the tricontinental. Obviously there are significant differences between that historical moment and today. The tricontinental had its own inconsistencies and problems and African Americans occupation of private and public spaces to bring down a system of apartheid is disparate from the contemporary inside resistance of using the tools of global capitalism to produce counterpower. But by calling attention to the black Atlantic roots of tricontinentalism, I am indeed intending to suggest that contemporary transnational solidarity politics renew its engagement with black Atlantic thought, foregrounding the fight against racial inequities in general and the fight for justice for peoples of African descent more specifically as a prerequisite to the futurity of Global South political organizing. So thank you so much. Thanks so much uh, for your talk. I'm gonna leave things off just with, a, I guess, a kind of a two-pronged fork of a question, uh, which may just be rehearsing your opening and closing frameworks, but the, the, two, the two prongs seem to be one on the level of uh, the, the question of sort of what is active in the, ideo the ideology of the, of the tricontinental, which strikes me as, as you talk about the aesthetic indicators, right, of actually what is maybe ar archaeologically available as, as ideology. And, but it strikes me that part of what's so interesting about this work is that it's not like ideology qua, you know, some kind of transcendent idea, right, but actually our Althusserian ideology, which is grounded in sense <coughs> of material practices that seem to be very much before here. So against the kind of uh, pop cultural phenomena that we see both in the 60s and 70s, man, you know, I don't care what color you are, whether you're black or green or purple, yeah. or you know, Bill Clinton's, you know, we're all mixed race. Uh, what you have is a series of <coughs> grassroots practices that, in which ideology is something that is practiced, right? And so conferences and magazines and so forth. I mean, that strikes me as a, as a big insistence here. Uh, but the second prong, and maybe the thing I'd like you to talk more about, is the, the overall framing and kind of, I think, polemical thrust of this work, which is the critical archaeology of the Global South. Um, and I'd love to hear your reflections about, uh, not just the sort of instrumentalization question, but what, this mean, what it means to bring the history, the, the genealogy of the Global South, back to itself, and what that does to the field. Um, I mean, that seems to be a real big not so much polemic, but a big, but a big imperative here. I'd love to hear your you know, final reflections on that. Okay, well, thank you so much for those questions. Um, well, I mean, to, to kind of speak to the first comment, I mean, you definitely have the sort of circulation, 
a, a formation of political community th through the circulation of texts, right? Um, but I think what's interesting about this is you're talking about whereas like in comparison to something like, you know, imagined communities or something like that, you have much more, you have a transnational, and a, a transnational notion of community that, and we're not even talking about represent like heads of state, for example. We're talking about like representatives from liberation movements within countries, right? And, and also from diverse liberation movements that sometimes were in, in conflict with each other, you know, um, groups on the left. So um, I think that's a, it's a really interesting, it, it really kind of, for me at least, changed I think about the circulation of texts and the formation of political community. Um, Christopher Lee talks about the Bandung moment as forming a kind of communitas um, instead of like an imagined community, which I think is a useful term. I think we can also tr think about it in terms of a sort of effective relationship that gets forged um, through, through text. Um, so I don't know if that responds to your initial question, but just thinking about like Althusserian ideology and the way that it functions in terms of a sort of hegemonic nation state model um, and thinking sort of beyond that in, in terms of the ideological, um, the circulation of text here and the ways in which uh, ideology is informing community. Um, and then the second part of your question around um, why do I think it's important to sort of provide some sort of historical <coughs> background for a concept like the Global South? Well, like what does it do? I'm not, inter I'm not interrogating it, right? But I mean, it seems to be imminent within this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I feel that, um, I mean, like I, I was trying to say in the talk, I think when we're seeing the emergence of these new horizontalist categories, I think it's really important to think about, you know, what is it that they're responding to? What are the, what are the sort of limitations that these new categories are responding to? Um, and in what ways might they be sort of trying to recapture? I mean, basically, I feel like what the Tricontinental did was try to um, correct some things that it saw in the Bandung moment, like a focus on nonviolence, for example, or you know, a sort of elision of Latin America. And I, and I feel like the, a lot of these new categories kind of represent an attempt to recover something that's lost. And I, I, to me, I think what that does, and when we think about what it recovers, to me, the most important thing that it recovers is that sort of really strong thread of black Atlantic thought that I don't know is necessarily, I mean, in, in, a, in something like minor transnationalism, I think you really see it. But in some of these concepts, I don't necessarily know that it's firmly grounded in like black Atlantic um, thought. So I don't know if that <laughs> answers. <laughs> Any other? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, <coughs> just two questions, one bigger and one smaller. I'll start with the smaller one. I'm just thinking about the fact that, first of all, I have to say that I'm coming at this from a global South, South imaginary that knows the Black Atlantic literature yeah. that is differential place, which is Southern Africa. Okay. So, I get slightly nervous about the notion that black Atlantic thought um, is the origin of the tricontinental movement only. So, I, I, you know, so my question was sort of geared towards that. In other words, like within the tricontinental, there is a kind of imperialism which says, suggests that there is, you know, that the Cuban moment uh, or the, those Cuban relations are kind of essential without them thinking, thinking about the kind of lateral crisscrosses that go between <coughs> continents. So I'm thinking about the fact that the um, color, so the smaller question is about the uh, color as metonym hitting, uh, hit, hitting its, its global limits with the apartheid imaginary that has a specific place for color and that, you know, early readings of young Mohammeds of, uh, of, of Salah Kumar is running into precisely the question Zoe Wickham talks about, which is, um, where you, the limits of using color as metonym are reached when colored, tricontinental colored hits South African apartheid colored population registry. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. The second more important question is, I, I, I find myself sort of slightly sort of pushing back against the notion that the tricontinental is erased because I think it's differentially erased. It's certainly not erased in, in, in South Africa, you know, you have where, where at the very same time that, that this was going on, there was, you know, massive movement with the ANC and communism for um, uh, a, a non-racial opposition. 
Um, and it's not um, after the tricontinental moment. It's also prior to it. So I'm just kind of worried, a little worried about this position that the Black Atlantic is, you know, it depends on what we think about Black Atlantic. Yeah. And I'm worried that, yeah. that we're not taking into account some simultaneous energies. So I think, you know, and yes, I do, absolutely. And I think, I mean, I, I think in some ways me saying, you know, okay, this, is, this originates in these Black Atlantic ideas is an oversimplification, absolutely. And I think what I'm responding to is a, is a sort of general framing of tricontinentalism as a Cuban movement, as a primarily Latin, Amer well, Latin American movement, although you, know, you have such an important involvement of African and Asian countries, but I th and, and, and the end as seen as a purely sort of Marxist movement, right? I mean, this is a, a moment where Cuba's Soviet dependency is increasing a lot. So one of the things that I'm responding to is that sort of formulation of tricontinentalism and trying to sort of, you know, think about, okay, so if we know that this idea, for example, the very idea for the Tricontinental Conference originated with this Afro-Cuban intellectual, you know, what circles was he in? What conversations was he responding to? How was he, so does that? It does make sense, but I do think you need to bring in the names that, that are part of the Sub-Saharan African part of that correspondence, you know, and this is not history in the sense that the majority number of doctors in rural areas in South Africa post-transition are Cuban. So none of this is, you know, it's only read differentially as past or a moment that passed, depending on where mm -hmm. you are. Depending, depending on your, yeah, yeah. positioning. Yeah. Well, it's funny because even within Cuba, it, it's seen as a kind of moment that's passed, I think. Right, which explains why Cubans go elsewhere to live in, to some degree. Huh. But no, but I, and I think what you said about when the metonym of color reaches its limits, I think that is really insightful and it's helping me think about, I was mentioning earlier to Magali, like this moment when, when South Africa became, becomes the main focus and there's, they start to make comparisons, for example, between the U.S. South and apartheid South Africa and um, the Southern Cone, like the, the, the act, like actions of the dictator, military dictatorships in the Southern Cone. And I'm wondering, and so you really see this conceptualized South start to emerge that is mapping on somewhat to a geography, but it's really a sort of conceptual notion of the South. And you're making me think, you know, I wonder if it might have, if that move towards thinking the South might have something to do with this metonym of color reaching some kind of limitation. But I'll have to think more about that. So, yeah. Um, thanks for this. Uh, uh, a couple of concerns. Uh, I'll, I'll try to mention two. Um, the first is, and that goes partly, partly back to, to uh, 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 the other question, um, uh, to Rose's question. Uh, when, uh, what you call uh, anti-imperialism, um, much of uh, this, uh, what we see going on here, is of course uh, intimately uh, tied to the world communist movement. There's a complete value. Uh, we have that uh, from uh, all the key figures that, you're, uh, uh, that are involved here. Uh, they are <coughs> traveling uh, back and forth uh, uh, to Moscow, speaking uh, uh, you name it. Um, plus, uh, much of uh, the language, uh, uh, both, the, both the images, uh, 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 the, the rhetoric, uh, the discursive formations are, are borrowed directly from the, from, uh, 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 the left here. Um, that uh, uh, seems to seems to somehow go go under uh, uh, when we are focusing on uh, race and anti-imperialism. That uh, there is a is a second uh, agenda uh, uh, in the mix. Uh, the other is um, with the focus on uh, tricontinentalism. Uh, are we running the risk of uh, essentializing global south? What, for example, is the Sino-Soviet split in the mid 1960s? Uh, the Afro-Asian Writers Bureau after 1965 was split into uh, two uh, factions, into two different bureaus uh, that were questioning each other's legitimacy, uh, that were uh, uh, traveling all over. This had ripple effects practically all over, uh, over the global south. Uh, in other words, do we have uh, competing, fighting uh, 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 global souths uh, all over the place? Um, uh, I, I, I see a little bit of a risk here. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, even within the tricontinent, it's not like some kind of, um, 
you know, utopian community. I mean, even within there's tensions, right? And, and you know, the Soviets are glaringly absent in tricontinental materials, but like you said, their influence is, is ever present, right? And I think um, you absolutely see the a sort of continuation of communist rhetoric. I mean, for example, the Caribbean Bureau um, in the 1930s, if you look at the rhetoric of like the Caribbean Bureau's newspapers and a lot of the tricontinental materials, you see a real kind of one-for-one -one relationship. But I think there, I think, um, there is a way in which the tricontinental is kind of picking back up on the sort of Negro question in Marxist thought um, and trying to actually move that question forward in a way that is um, more inclusive of um, Afro-diasporic peoples. So I don't know if I'm, there were a lot of elements to your question, but could you kind of say a little bit more? Um. I'm chiefly interested in how you how you look at the at the second question uh, uh, that we don't have one global South movement, but there are uh, several. Uh, there are of course there are also movements that are uh, sponsored uh, then yeah. by CIA and so on, um, uh, paradoxically. Uh, but uh, there are, there is a hodgepodge of uh, movements uh, going on. Uh, there's fierce inter fighting uh, uh, throughout the 60s, 70s. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not trying to. I mean, I'm not try, trying to propose this as. What I'm trying to think about is a, a particular moment that happens when Bandung moves into the Americas and the way that it picks up on certain questions in hemispheric American thought, right? But I'm not trying to propose that this is the sort of only one singular origin, right? Or that there weren't even conflicts within the tricontinental itself in, in terms of how to imagine a sort of tricontinentalist political imaginary sub or subjectivity. But I am calling attention to this movement as I think a very particularly important and understudied and under theorized movement um, in, in terms of thinking about the global south, but also in terms of thinking about the common turns legacy um, in, in, in forging a sort of new global south political imaginary. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I was wondering if you had any reflections on, um, I mean, you, you know, talked about global capitalism, but I guess more specifically with what is happening with global capitalism at this particular moment and how that relates to um, to the tricontinental. And I'm thinking especially towards, uh, you know, as you get towards the 70s and you think oil crisis, and there's major structural changes going on um, with capitalism that, uh, you know, might also play into the decline of the movement. I don't know, I'm just wondering if you yeah, to think like in more specific terms, but, but, but. Do you mean like social movements within global capitalism, or no, do you guess, mean the I ways guess. that, like, that, that resistance is being theorized within global capitalism, or? Yeah, well, I guess I'm just thinking, you know, there's, well, actually, in the of this question, mm -hmm. what is the, the poster that you showed, um, where it says, we will destroy a from the outside, and they will destroy it from the inside, right? Which, um, I guess it sort of I, it sort of seems to me that certainly later on by the seventies that inside of imperialism and outside of imperialism becomes much more difficult to sustain. Yeah, right. Like that's not it becomes more evident that that's not the way imperialism works. Yeah, um, and so uh, with all of the economic changes that that go on. And, um, so yeah, I guess. So yeah, and I mean, there. I, I'm definitely kind of talking about a moment when some of the ideas that now we take for granted, right, are the notion of a sort of like deterritorialized global empire, maybe, um, to which there really is no outside resistance has to come from within. You know, so I'm trying to trace a sort of germinating moment of some of those ideas, where if you say, you know, we will destroy imperialism from the outside, they will destroy it from the inside. Well, how are you defining? imperialism and how if, if we're not talking about I mean the notion of imperialism that they have although the US figures prominently it's not necessarily tied to any one particular nation and so what does it mean even though you have that inside outside division in that articulation of the project there is a kind of liminal notion of what it means to be on the outside or what it means to be on the inside of an empire that's absolutely global right so they're not just talking about settler colonialism or exploitation colonialism, right? They're talking about empire in a way that 
seems much more similar to the way that we think about like transnational capital. Um, so I think that gets to part of your question, maybe. And then the other part was, But I think, you know, and what I was kind of trying to say at the end here is I think one of the things that's interesting is when you think about the anti-capitalist movement or the alter globalization movement, I mean, that movement has been really criticized for engaging in this sort of like neoliberal multiculturalist rhetoric, right? I mean, that's been the, that was the main critique of Occupy. That was a huge critique of the World Social Forum. And then you have these racial justice movements that seem to be well, at least in Latin America, very much about sort of a sort of representational politics being involved in a multicultural state, or in the U.S., very much focused on reforming the state. Um, that don't and and so there seems to be a kind of um, kind of di divergence, dissonance between those two. And I'm interested in this moment because I think it's a moment where those two things were fundamentally combined. Um, and so I'm interested in trying to think about you know, okay, so what was what were the discursive rhetorical moves around thinking political community in this discourse? And how is that present or missing in our contemporary uh, moment? What do you see like, happening to, like, I know you mentioned, sorry, I don't want to, but the, the, the journal it was published like, through the 1990s. So yeah. what do you see, I guess, because most of your examples were from the early 60s, yeah. and so I'm just wondering what. So, okay, all of this stuff is published English, Spanish, French, Arabic up until 1990 when, you know, the Cuban economy collapses, right, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And then they pick back up in 1995, um, and the bulletin is still published, the magazine is still published, the posters are still published, but ve on a very, very small scale. Um, and it's interesting, there's not, in the current materials, there's not nearly as much of a focus on militancy, for example. Um, it's actually a lot of the materials kind of, I mean, they reprint a lot of articles from like The Nation or, I mean, it's, it, it's pretty kind of standard leftist kind of rhetoric. The global south is a term that's used a lot in these materials, the south, the global south for talking about um, the tricontinental alliance. Um, but yeah, still, still producing, still distributing, so. Marley. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Uh -huh. uh, thanks so much for a great talk. Um, I, my question, and this is not a, there's no value judgment in this question about, but, but the question has to do with actually with something that you mentioned but sort of minimized, which is the relationship of the Trekan continental to the Cuban state and the Cuban state yeah. policy apparatus, yeah. which as you well know, between 1967 and 1976 uh, is, you know, under, uh, Losing, first of all, losing in the cosmopolitan intellectual left of Paris, New York, Mexico City, Buenos Aires, um, uh, for very real forms of persecution of Cuban intellectuals. You mentioned Voltaire, Carpo Nails, actually sort of falling, running afoul of yeah. some of that in that way. But so, but so, so the tricontinental is also the King Kenya of Greece. Yeah. And how do they map okay. onto one another? So. Because it seems like an interesting story. It, it, yes, thank you for asking that question. And it's something that I, in the larger project, really try to tease out. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting relationship, the Cuban state and, the, and this tricontinental. I mean, even now, they, the, the people of OSPAL, uh, the tricontinental, they will tell you, like, we are a non-governmental organization. We do not represent the Cuban state, um, which I think is really interesting. But so you have this you know, way in which tricontinental materials are being shaped by the perspectives of all of these delegations, right? Um, and then you also have the fact that all of these materials are being produced in Cuba um, during the moment of like its highest, you know, Soviet influence. So one example um, that I think illustrates it really well is, so the issue on the Young Lords, um, the Young Lords were, for anybody who doesn't know, the kind of radical, Puerto Rican radicalist group similar to the Black Panthers. The issue on the Young Lords, um, it, it, you know, and the Young Lords were really progressive, um, I think, in comparison to, like, for example, the Black Panthers. They had, like, a gay and lesbian caucus. Um, they um, w had a trans, uh, had um, close relationships with uh, the trans community. 
So the issue on the Young Lords is published right before the next issue that appears, is the issue that reprints all of the resolutions from the 1971 education, Culture and Educational Congress in which the Cuban state defines homosexuality as a form of deviance, as counter-revolutionary. And the thing that happens, is so, so on the one hand you have you know, anyone who would look into, like the Young Lords, for example, would get exposed to an organization that has ideas that I think run afoul of the Cuban state's ideas at this moment. The other thing that happens is when they publish all of those resolutions, um, a number of the distributors of tricontinental materials pull out, the European distributors. So there's this kind of like dialogic relationship between what the Cuban state is trying to do in this moment and the way that tri the tricontinental is being conceived by the people that read its materials and by the people participating in it. Does that answer your, okay. Oh, I have a question. I'm sorry that Nico has left because I think his line of questioning was, was putting his finger on something. Um, so, so my question is perverse, right? Which is like, what's the global cell? Yeah. Um, but it comes out of uh, one of Nico's last remarks, which is like, can we not think about sort of global cells and sort yeah. of that difference within this big thing called the global cell, right? And that is a response to the sort of perceived cohesion, although in this sort of conversation that you've been having, you've been teasing it out a little bit, perceived co cohesion or certainly sense of kind of in central directorate for the tricontinental, right? That there was someone, at least there was this body of administrators administering to an extent and keeping the whole thing going. And I wanted to sort of ask you maybe to make the question a little bit less broad and perverse than what is the global south, make it um, you've given us a kind of, <clears throat> it's both a genealogy in terms of the relationship between the tricontinental and the global south and an analogy that you've been drawing, and I wanted to hear you say how the global south isn't like the tricontinental. Um, oh. And, and sort of get at a definition of the global south there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, and getting back to his question, I mean, I think one of the, I'm trying to think about, the, I mean, the ways in which, um, you know, what the common turn tried to do, I mean, one of the biggest critiques, at least in the Americas, was its inability really to address issues facing um, people of Af African descent, right? And so I think that the Tricontinental is trying to get at that and respond to that in some ways. But okay, so what is, how is the Global South not the Tricontinental? I mean, um, in a lot of <laughs> ways, <laughs> I mean, when you're t you're thinking about something like, um, I mean, I think probably the best like sort of praxis of global like a global South praxis would probably be like the World Social Forum, for example, um, where you know you don't have the kind of centralized hierarchical organization that you have in the Tricontinental, for example or the, the, the notion, the ways in which uh, resistance is being thought about is, you know, taking capitalism apart like from its very inside. So there's, there's similarities in terms of this notion of like the inside, but the inside is totally conceived differently. Um, I mean, I don't know, could you tell, I mean, what do you think? Like, could you tell me a little bit more of where, yeah. No, so I guess I asked the question as a way of getting at the distinction of the global south and the tricontinental, because I think, I think Nico's line of questioning didn't just put his finger on sort of issues that would call sort of to more clarity and definition, but also the kind of, the nature of the thing global south is different from the nature of the thing tricontinental, and it has to do with that gesture of abstraction that you trace in terms of that, this sort of metonymic, you know, yeah. right, to name ideology. And the Global South seems to me to function through sort of strategies of abstraction that range from, frankly, metonymy to something like metaphor, right, to things that are much more sort of distant, yeah. um, in a way that the tricontinental didn't, um, that, that it was much more sort of literal and its things were sort of yeah. stuck together rather than in some kind of distance relationship. And, and that seems to me a sort of problem of the, the paradigm of the global south. And it's, I mean, we've talked about this a lot, it's potential as well, but that seems to me the, the sort of the thought move, like the, the brain steps, right? The thought exercise of thinking the global south versus the tricontinental is quite different. Um. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think even the ways in which, you know, solidarity gets forged around people who like mutually recognize one another through their shared experience of subjugation under global capitalism. I mean, the tricontinental was kind of trying to come up with a terminology or a word for talking about that subjectivity in that community. I don't really think we have a word for that. The global south or something like that would be the closest notion, but that's not something that people necessarily use like in, I don't know. So yeah, thank you. I'm going to have to think about your question a lot more. It's a really good question. We're out of time, so please join me.